by 1882, everybody had left, and hence, nickname for the village, Deserta Village. This area was first settled about 1736 by an English gentleman named Peter Wilcox. Uh, this was the frontier of America at that time. Nobody lived here yet, but he had a vision that people would start to come out this way from the, town, the big towns like Elizabethtown or from the agricultural areas like the West Fields beyond Elizabethtown. So he built a sawmill down along the Blue Brook. He knew that people would need lumber to build their farmhouses. And so he got here ahead of them. He started cutting down the trees, running them through the sawmill and making lumber. And as he was cutting down the trees, he ended up clearing the land. So his family became farmers as well. And they were in this area for 100 years. Um, in 1845, a gentleman named David Felt came here. David had a business called Stationers Hall Press. It was originally in Boston. Um, they were in the business of selling actually producing and selling products that businesses would need to operate things like receipt books and ledger pads and ink and you know pencils so he had a business in Boston but he moved it down to New York City sometime before 1844 he established a store on Pearl Street in Manhattan but by 1844 his store was selling products faster than the factory could produce it so he needed another factory by 1850 he had 175 people living here and working for him. He built a town of, we believe, 22 buildings. He had a business here for 15 years and they did a good business, um, but by 1860, the country was on the verge of the Civil War. He was doing some business with the, with the South. That may have been part of his decision-making to leave here. We also know that he had a brother named Willard who was managing the factory in Brooklyn and the store in Manhattan because David couldn't be here and manage that as well. And in 1860, Willard was ill so, and, and also David was 67 years old. So all of those factors combined uh, led him to sell this property and leave here. Um, and, and he went back to New York. And as he was leaving here in a carriage, he is uh, quoted as having said, well, King David is dead and the village will go to hell. And it turns out he was right. Over the next 22 years, the property changed hands six different times. Six different businesses were tried and failed. And every time a business would fail, some of those 175 people that David had brought here to live and, and to work for him started to move away. By 1882, everybody had left, and hence the nickname for the village, Deserta Village. When uh, Peter Wilcox was here, this area was known as Peter's Hill. When it was the town that David Felt built, it was called Feltville. It was named after him. But in 1882, it became the Deserta Village. Um, it actually only stayed deserted, I believe, for a few months. Uh, another gentleman named Warren Ackerman bought the property and converted it into a summer resort, which he called Glenside Park. And it was a very popular resort from 1882 all the way until 1916. People could come here, spend their summers. They could do thing like, things like golf, uh, baseball, croquet, horseback riding. There was just plenty of things to do. But by 1916, um, people were buying that newfangled contraption, the automobile. And with that, they were able to go further away on vacation. So they started going to this new hotspot vacation area called the Jersey Shore. And as the Jersey Shore became more popular, mountain resorts like Glenside Park became less popular. And in 1916, this, this resort closed up. In 1921, the voters of Union County decided that Union County would become the second county in New Jersey and only the fifth county in all of the United States to have a county park system. And the, the park commission was formed. The park commissioners set to work laying out what would be their first four parks and one of them was the Watching Reservation. And they, as quickly as possible, bought up a lot of property that included all the property that had been Feltville um, or Glenside Park and incorporated into the park. The cemetery is really not officially a cemetery, it's a collection of headstones. And I say that because there's nobody actually buried under those stones. Peter, he passed away in 1768, and down there is his will. And you can see in the will, the first few lines, he talks about that it, he leaves his 30 acres to his wife Phoebe, and then he breaks up the rest of his, his estate, okay? But he's dead um, in 1768. Phoebe 
that date that she died is actually wrong. She died on uh, June 26, 1776. It could be that because you had to go all the way to Elizabeth to record those dates that someone just messed up at that point, mm -hmm. or it could simply be when they made the stone, they carved it wrong. That's not an original headstone. None of these are. Those are all placed, placed here by Sons and Daughters of American Revolution, except this stone here, this is the original. There is a cemetery that is elsewhere in those woods. We don't know the exact location. We have a rough idea. The bodies haven't been moved from the original site. This is not the original site. Okay. The stones have been moved. Okay, gotcha. So like I said, that's the only original stone. So there's that stone is down there? No, uh, there's no uh, bodies. They might be under your feet, but they're not under my feet. <laughs> uh, so where's the actual... We're not sure. It's out here somewhere. Um, some of the maps of Feltville era show the cemetery being behind that house, but everything's relative. We're not sure exactly where. The stones are more recent. They were put there in the 1960s by the state of New Jersey after a local historian found that they were buried there and he got the state to produce the stones because these were veterans, so they're veterans' headstones. Um, but by then, nobody knew exactly where those stones belonged. And even John Wilcox, his stone had been stolen from here twice and returned. And when it came back the last time, they didn't know exactly where it belonged. So they picked a spot that looked good. Even today, the deserted village is not completely deserted. I live here with my sons and uh, a woman who is an employee of ours lives down the further, road, uh, further down the road with a friend of hers. The deserted village name really draws people out and, you know, mystery and hauntedness. Are the scares real? I've been here 25 years. I haven't seen a ghost, an apparition, anything yet. Um, there, there are stories like the floating hat. Uh, there's a story about um, some people who got their picture taken down by Masker's Barn and there's this like top hat floating in the picture above their heads and you know it wasn't there in real life but it showed up in the picture. Um, there are, there's a story about three girls who disappeared. Um, this was you know a long time ago. They, uh, I think the early 1900s, they disappeared into the woods and nobody ever saw them again but their, their hats, their three hats were found somewhere. The man and woman who used to live in this house, she told me that one time she looked out the front door at the utility pole that's right across the street and she saw a man standing next to it and he was dressed in a black suit with a black top hat and she thought that it was David Felt and she turned to yell Charlie you know to her husband to come look out the door and by the time she looked back he was gone so you know those are the kind of stories we have but uh, we, we haven't had paranormal investigators here. We've had some who've asked about, you know, coming into our buildings and doing metering and all that kind of stuff, but there, there really have been no significant um, hauntings of any type um, in, in any of the time that I've been here. Deserted Village is one of the treasures of Union County, and uh, the Union County freeholders who oversee uh, the spending for the the Union County Parks are really, have really been pleased to invest in this area of the park. Every dollar that's put into Deserted Village is very carefully spent and wisely maintained. The uh, general intent of the master plan is to make as many of the buildings accessible to the public as possible in, in a variety of ways. Uh, three of the buildings, uh, including the one that I live in, would be resident caretakers. I, I am designated as a resident caretaker now. We would have two other houses that have people living in them. The other houses, one has murals in it that were painted in 1927 by a Nicaraguan artist that would be restored as a, uh, an art museum. Some of the other houses uh, would be restored as house museums. One, you'd be able to go in and see what it was like to live in a mill worker's cottage, this small cottage that had you know, two or four families crammed into it. And, and right next door to it will be a cottage that'll be restored to look like a summer resort cottage. And you see how different it was, having a wide porch like this that you could hang out on, you know, laying in a hammock, having the whole house to live in instead of just a piece of the house. Two of the houses are intended to be temporary housing. They could be used um, if there was a corporate program going on here, like a corporate retreat, that people could stay in the house for a number of days or if there was a college program, the students could 
could stay there during the course of their program, um, or they could be rented by families as an inexpensive vacation. I'm standing here in Masker's barn, which dates from the 19th century when this was a summer resort for people who would come out from New York City and other urban places. Now we use this as a public space. We sometimes hold uh, parks-related meetings here, but we open up the space for people who want to have family parties, we have weddings, dinners. We're lucky that the New Jersey Historic Trust helped with getting this building back into a condition that could be used by the public. And eventually, we would like to open up some more buildings too, but for the moment, um, we have many, many sites for people to come and enjoy here in Deserted Village. There are, there are two major programs that we do. You know, besides our visitor center being open every weekend, we do a, a program in October um, that is like an open house. The, the County of Union runs a program called Four Centuries in a Weekend. And in that weekend, which is the third weekend of October every year, there are about 35 historic sites that open up across Union County. We are the largest of all of the 35 or 36 sites that are in the Four Centuries program. And we provide a lot of activities for people to enjoy those two days. We have hay rides, we have old-fashioned children's games, we have guided tours and self-guided tours. Our general store is open. You can go in and not only see the exhibits, but you can buy refreshments and souvenirs. So lots of activities and it's all free. And typically we get over 2,500 visitors in just those two afternoons. So it's become very popular. Uh, we added a, a new uh, aspect to it this year. We have new signage throughout the site. It's interpretive signage, uh, very professional, typical of what you'll see in a state or a national park. As you walk around the site, you can stop at 15 different locations and read these signs that give you a, a good understanding of the history of the village. And they have photographs and maps and you know lots of things, lots of information. People who come through here are very positive about their experience. Uh, so many people who live nearby say, oh, I never knew that Deserted Village existed. We estimate that we're actually getting about 100,000 visitors a year strolling through here either coming to see the historic sites or just coming to hike or jog or walk their dog, ride a horse. Um, people come here for all sorts of reasons. Deserted village, uh, just walking in here, you feel as if you're really in another world. And each person who comes here contributes to making it really a place for all of us.